Well, hello, Saddleback. I'm glad you're here today. You survived our rally on a Saturday in Angel Stadium, and what a day that was. And I want to welcome you to Daring Faith, the key to miracles. This is going to be a 10-week campaign, the longest we've ever done, because there's so much for me to teach you on how faith and miracles go together in your life. You know, I was sitting backstage uh, right before I, I came out, and I was having some uh, Daniel Plan-approved almond snacks. <laughs> and I just thought while I was eating them, I, I, I'd read the, you know, the container, and it says, ingredients. And there's one ingredient, almonds. Okay, okay. And right underneath it, allergen disclaimer. This product contains almonds. <laughs> you just told me that. But now we have a disclaimer saying it contains almonds. So I want to be in full disclosure. Uh, this is called Daring Faith, the Key to Miracles. And the disclaimer is, I am going to stretch your faith. I am going to challenge your faith. I'm going to poke it. I'm going to prod it. And in many times during this series, you're not going to feel real comfortable. Because we don't grow in comfort. Growth is often uncomfortable. But the result of growth is blessing, maturity, answered prayers, and so many other wonderful, wonderful things which I want you to get to. And so in full disclaimer, in this Daring Faith series, I am going to challenge your faith. Now the Bible says this on your outline there, Romans chapter one, verse 17. The gospel shows us how God makes people right with himself. And by the way, the word gospel, simply the only English word for good news. That's all it means, good news. The gospel shows us how God makes people right with himself and that it begins and it ends with what? Okay, circle that. It begins and ends with faith. That's how we get right with God. The scripture says that those who are right with God will live by trusting him. The just shall live by faith. And then look at the next verse, Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, that's enough reason right there for us to spend 10 weeks on daring faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Did you know that God wants to reward you for earnestly seeking him? And if you believe that, the Bible says the just live by faith. Now, if the Bible says the way to live is by faith, the way we connect with God is by faith, and without faith it's impossible to please God, what in the world is faith? Well, we're gonna take 10 weeks to talk about that. And faith is like a diamond, it's multifaceted. But one of the evidences and one of the elements of faith that I want us to start off, this is just an introduction this weekend, I want you to write this down. Faith, write it on your outline, faith is seeing from God's point of view. Faith is seeing from God's point of view. And I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. Let me tell you first what faith is not, okay? Faith is not desire. You can wish for something, you can hope for something, you can pray for something, you can sincerely desire and, and crave something. That doesn't mean it's faith. Faith is not desire. Desire may lead you to faith, but desire isn't faith. For instance, I remember as a kid, my desire uh, as a teenager was to get a car. And that was a great big desire, a huge desire is to get a car, but it wasn't faith. And, and desire is not the same thing. Another thing faith isn't, is it's not pretending that something is true that isn't true. You know, it, I could have some butter sitting right here and I could say, uh, I believe that that's chocolate. And I have faith that it's chocolate. No, it doesn't matter how much faith I say I've got, it's not chocolate, it's butter. And it's not gonna be chocolate no matter how much I say it's chocolate. And so faith is not psyching yourself up and pretending uh, something it is that really isn't true. You're not conning yourself into believing something. Faith is not a feeling. Now this is really important. In fact, you need to understand that feelings often get in the way of faith. Because you feel a certain way, then you wanna go that way whether you have the faith or not. And feelings are what we tend to rely on instead of our faith. And a lot of times faith says, I'm gonna move ahead in spite of my feelings. 
I'm gonna do the right thing in spite of my feelings, that's faith. And faith is not bargaining with God. It's not saying, God, if you'll do this, then I'll do this. God is not uh, a gambler. Uh, Lord, if you'll do this, then I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll do this and you know, make a bribe or, or a bargain with God. That's not faith. We're gonna look at what faith is, and this weekend we're looking at the fact that faith is a way of seeing. Faith is a way of looking at the world from God's point of view. It's having God's perspective. Let me show you a couple of verses. Hebrews chapter 11, verse one says this. What is faith? Faith is the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen, not might, not, not, not hopefully, but what we hope for is going to happen, and to be certain of the things we do not see. I want you to circle the phrase, we do not see. Faith is being certain of things we do not see. It has to do with your vision. Now, yesterday at the Angel Stadium event, we talked about vision and the vision of Saddleback Church. We talked about the dream of Saddleback Church. And we talked about where are we going in the vision and dream. And by the way, if you missed that message, uh, you need to watch it online because it's kind of the introduction of this whole series. But the Bible says that faith is a way of seeing. Now, would you agree that there's always more than one way to look at something? If you're married, you really know that's true. <laughs> because, and if you've got kids, you know that's true. There's always, always more than one way of looking at something. Sometimes there might be a dozen different ways of looking at something, but what really matters is not how you see it and not even how I see it, but how God sees it. And faith is learning to see things from God's point of view, having his vision. Ephesians 1.18 is the master verse on this, and it says there, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be flooded with light so that you can see, so that you can see, so that you can see the wonderful future that God has promised to those he called. Now we just sang about this verse. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, I want to see you. Now, what does that mean? We're singing this great song, what does it mean? I don't have eyes in my heart. What in the world is he talking about? What that verse is talking about is that there's an unseen realm in the world that's more real than the seen realm. For instance, you can see this chair right now because it's made out of wood and it's got paint on it, uh, but you can't see the Holy Spirit. However, the Holy Spirit is more real than this chair. And the Holy Spirit is gonna live for eternity because he is God, this chair is gonna break down and wear out. The Bible says that everything you see is temporary. Your body, your hair, and a lot of other things. Anything you see is temporary, it's not gonna last. The things that last are actually unseen. And this is where the faith realm comes in. And the Bible has many, many examples of what I call seeing with spiritual eyes, or seeing with your eyes of the heart seeing from God's point of view. The Bible tells us over in Genesis 21 about Hagar and her son Ishmael who had been cast out by Abraham. And because of uh, jealous Sarah, she's sent out into the desert and she's there in the desert with no water and she's gonna die. And Sarah calls out to God in the middle of the desert and she goes, Lord, don't let me watch my, my child die. And all of a sudden it says God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water in the middle of the desert, and they lived. The Bible tells us in 2 Kings chapter six about Elisha and Gehazi and how an enemy nation was, were, were coming against, the army was coming against uh, uh, Jerusalem and, and the Jews. And Gehazi, who was Elisha's servant, gets very, very um, uh, frightened and very, very upset. He's, he's having a panic attack, and God, I mean, our Elisha says to Gehazi, Gehazi, I don't want you to be upset. He instead he prays this, Lord, open the eyes of my servant. And all of a sudden, Gehazi, it says his spiritual vision is opened up and it says he could see a realm of angels circling the city of Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, he wasn't afraid anymore. Well, you wouldn't be either if you saw a realm of angels. God opened his spiritual eyes. 
The Bible tells us that in Genesis 13, God takes Abraham up on a hill and says, look up at the stars. And he says, just imagine this. This is going to be your ancestor, ancestry. These are going to be the number of people in your nation, as many as you can count and even more. And the Bible says God opened his eyes. He had a moment of spiritual clarity. After the resurrection, the Bible tells us that two disciples are walking down the street and they're all upset and they're all discouraged because Jesus died on the cross. Their hopes have been crushed. Their, their dreams have been dashed. They are in despair. And all of a sudden Jesus comes walking with them and they have a conversation. They invite him in for dinner. They don't recognize who it is. They sit down, they have a meal together, and it says then when he blessed the meal, it says God opened their eyes, and all of a sudden they realize Jesus is right here in my midst. That's what God wants to do in faith in you. He wants to open your eyes when you see, oh, Jesus is right here with me. Oh, the angels are circling around me. Oh, God has a plan much bigger than my plan for my life, and on and on and on. And so I want us to do a couple things today. I want us to um, uh, look at what happens when we see with eyes of fear and look at what happens when we see with eyes of faith. Just kind of as an introduction because until you understand how important it is to see everything in life through eyes of faith, you're not going to be looking for that. Now a good example of this is in the Old Testament in the book of Numbers, chapter 13 and 14, a book that isn't read much by people but it's got a lot of spiritual truth in it. And here's the background of Numbers 13 and 14. Moses has led the nation of Israel to freedom. He's got them free from Pharaoh and the Egyptians. They've crossed the Red Sea. Um, They've been traveling for about two years, not 40 years, just about two years uh, from Egypt, taking a very slow pace, because it certainly wouldn't take that long to walk from Egypt to Israel across the Sinai. But they got a lot of people and they're slow and they're going along and uh, they're coming up to a place called Kadesh. And at Kadesh, they're getting ready to cross the Jordan and go into the promised land. This is the land that's been promised to them for 400 years that they would have their own country, they would have freedom, they would be free from slavery. When they get up to the edge of the water, before they go in, Moses says, okay, before we go in, I wanna send in a spy team. I'm going to pick 12 guys to go in and spy out the land. They're going to do reconnaissance. They're going to do the due diligence. They're going to check out what's going on and and do a little fact finding. And so 12 spies are connected, are are, are chosen by, um, by Moses, and they are sent in to go visit the land. When they come back, they give a mixed report. Two of the two of the spies say, it's incredible, let's go take it. It's ready for our taking. God has given us truly the promised land. And those two spies were named Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb. The other 12, other 10 spies come back and said, yeah, it's a great place, but, and they have a whole list of problems on why they can't go in. They're not seeing with eyes of faith, they're seeing with eyes of fear. Now, let me read you the names of these guys. It, raise your hand if you've heard of any of these guys. Shaphat, nobody, Igal, Palti, uh, Gadiel, Amiel, Sether, Nabi, Gelu, Shamu, oh, not the whale, uh, <laughs> Shamu, okay, okay, and then Caleb, yeah, and Joshua, yeah. Here's the point nobody remembers the negative guys. Nobody remembers the critics who say it can't be done. The only people who get remembered are the guys who said, let's go do it, in God's name. They saw with eyes of faith, the others saw with eyes of fear. Now because they failed to see with eyes of faith, that entire generation missed God's purpose for their life and God's will. And and God said, okay, you, you failed the test, you can wander around the wilderness for the next 40 years until you all die. I don't want that to happen in your life. I don't want you to wander in the wilderness for 40 years and then die simply because you didn't learn to see with eyes of faith. This is why Daring Faith, Key to Miracles is such an important campaign. Because I want you in the promised land. And I want you to get in it now. 
Now what happens when we see with eyes of fear and see with eyes of faith? Let's go over these real quickly. First, five things happen when we see with eyes of fear and they're all here in, in Numbers uh, chapter 13 and 14. Number one, write these down. First, we exaggerate our difficulties. We exaggerate our difficulties. Now, here's an amazing thing. God has just delivered them from Egypt, the most powerful nation in the world, and yet now they're worried about some local tribe. They've just defeated Pharaoh, and yet now they're worried about somebody else. And how quickly we forget. When you look at your problems with eyes of fear, they get bigger. And the more you look at your problem, the more the exaggerated it gets. Somebody criticizes you, the more you think about it, pretty soon you think the whole world's criticizing you. It grows by proportion. Numbers 13, verse 27, 28. Here was the negative report. It's a magnificent land, said the negative spies. But, and there's always a big but. It's a magnificent land, but the people living there are powerful and their cities are fortified and large. And what's more, we saw Anakim giants there. Now, the Anakim were of the tribe of Skywalker. And... <laughs> And the force was strong with them. And that's another story. Sorry, I got confused there. The next verse, 31 and 32, says, Other spies said, they'd crush us. So the majority report of the spies was negative. I, I want to point out something here. The majority report is almost always negative. Anybody who's going to get done, something done in this world is going to have to go against the majority report. Because the, num the majority of people are going to be looking with eyes of fear, not eyes of faith. And they said, they said we see these people and they'd crush us. Uh, that word there actually in, in uh, Hebrew is uh, akal, which means to eat up. It means to devour. So, man, they, they'd eat us alive. They're like canna cannibals. They're bullies. They're tyrants. They're, they're NFL backers. They're, they're, they're going to take us on and we'll be crushed. Only two of the spies have faith, Joshua and Caleb, and and yet the people always trust the minority. No, they always trust the majority report because there's always more worriers and there's always more naysayers and there's always more critics and more fearful, fretful, negative people. Now here's the problem. Negative attitudes are contagious. When they walked up there to the edge, everybody was excited about going into the promised land. It was only when 10 came back and said we can't do it that everybody changed their mind. And they began to get infected with a negative attitude. Now here's what's ironic. They said this place is filled with giants and, and we can't take them on and they're too heavy, they're too big for us and too powerful. Ironically, 38 years later, when the next generation did get to go into um, the promised land, you know what the enemy said? They said, we have lived in panic for 40 years because we heard about the 10 plagues of Egypt. And we heard about what your God had done against the most powerful leader in the world, Pharaoh, and we were scared to death and we were ready to surrender. We were ready. We were ready to surrender. So you needlessly walked around in the wilderness for 40 years because we were scared to death of you. We exaggerate our difficulties. Second thing we do when we see eyes of fear, we underestimate our own abilities. We exaggerate the problem, but we underestimate our own abilities abilities. And in verse 33 of Numbers 13, it says this, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Now you talk about low self-esteem. They're saying we're insects. We're just a bunch of bugs compared to those guys. They're going to eat us for lunch. We can't do that. And notice they say, we saw ourselves like grasshoppers in our own eyes, that's their own self-image, and it says, and we looked the same to them. How do they know how they looked to the enemy? They didn't. There's a word for this. It's called projection. You tend to project your fears on everybody else around you. And that's what they're doing there. They're projecting their fears. They'd been slaves for 400 years. They'd been freed for 40 but they're still mentally enslaved in a condition they still see themselves as helpless. And they still see themselves enslaved. They're enslaved not by a Pharaoh now, but by an idea, by an image, by a self-concept. Now, let's just stop here for a minute. Because a lot of year, many years ago, people said things about you and to you and behind your back that you overheard that were not true, but you believed them. They're not even in your life anymore. Some of them are even dead. 
and you're still believing their lives. You're still enslaved to their image of you. And you had somebody, a parent or a partner or a, a friend or a brother or sister who said, you're uncoordinated. And so you think you're uncoordinated. Or uh, you're, you're never going to amount to much, so you think you're never going to amount to much. Or, you're not good at speaking, or on and on. They told you all those things. You're not in Egypt anymore. That's a self-imposed prison. This is why Celebrate Recovery is so much better than any other recovery addiction program. If you go to AA, they keep you saying for the rest of your life, you stand up and say, hi, my name's Joe and I'm an alcoholic. Now the guy may have been sober for 35 or 40 years, but he stands up and his first identity is, hi, I'm Joe and I'm an alcoholic. He's still identifying with his weakness with his problem, with his struggle, with his sin, or whatever. The point that we say in Celebrate Recovery, we don't say that in Celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery, we stand up and say, hi, my name is Joe, and I'm a follower of Jesus who struggles with alcohol. See the difference? Your primary identity is not your sin. Your primary identity is not your fault, is not your weakness, is not your miscue, is not your failure. Your primary identity is in Christ. I am a believer who struggles with loneliness, struggles with codependency, struggles with worry, struggles with panic attacks. That's not your primary identity. You're seeing with eyes of fear instead of eyes of faith. And so we, uh, we overestimate the problem and we underestimate our abilities. You know, it's funny that it said that some of the spies saw these guys and said, these, these, they were tall, and they said, these guys are giants. What's interesting is later when they went in, they found out that the taller people were actually the most calm and the most peaceful. And they, they had nothing to be afraid of. The, those, the, the, the tall people were not even warriors. It's just they all had it in their mind. Third thing that happens when you see with eyes of faith, uh, fear, we get discouraged. First, they overestimate the problem. Second, they underestimate their own ability. We're like insects, we're just grasshoppers. Third, they get discouraged. And in Numbers 14, one, it says, then all the people began weeping aloud and they carried on all night. They had a giant pity party. Poor us. And they're now crying and weeping because they don't get to go into the promised land. What's keeping them out? Their fear. They're not living by faith. We get discouraged. And then quickly we move to number four, and that is we move from, from discouragement to griping. We start to gripe about all of our lives and everything that's gonna go wrong in our lives. And in verse two, after the all night pity party, it says, then all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. They picked on the leaders. We wish we had died in Egypt, they wailed or even here in the wilderness. Now notice, first they, 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 uh, they mourned and now they murmur. And first they cry and now they can complain. What it is, it's discontent. By the way, let me just say this to you. Highly critical people are always highly insecure people. It's, it's dominated by fear. When you find somebody who's critical of other people, it's because they're incredibly insecure and if I don't feel good about me, I certainly don't want you feeling good about you. So I'm gonna criticize and I'm gonna complain and I'm gonna you know, be against any success that you might have. But we underestimate our abilities, we get discouraged, we, we gripe about our lives and then eventually, number five, the next verse, we give up and we blame God. We give up and we blame God. Verse three, they said, why is the Lord, notice, why is the Lord bringing us to this land to be killed with swords? We'd be better off going back to Egypt. You know what they're saying there? We know better than God. We know better than God. Notice, they're blaming God for not letting them go in the promised land. God isn't holding them back. It's their fear that's holding them back. So they're second guessing, and now all of a sudden they're remembering the good old days of Egypt. Good old days? What was the good old days? 400 years of slavery. Why would anybody want to go back to Egypt? It was slavery but it was safety. It was safe slavery. And a lot of people get stuck in safe slavery. And they're enslaved by a relationship, 
or they're enslaved by a fear, or they're enslaved by a habit, or they're enslaved by a compulsion, or they're enslaved by a thought that I have to do a certain thing. And, and to let go of that, they, they really don't like it, but at least it's predictable, it's comfortable. And I know what's in Egypt. And some of you are doing that. Some of you are confusing slavery and safety. They're not the same thing. You, know, you say, I know it's a bad situation, but at least it's predictable. And I know this habit is self-defeating, but it's, it's comfortable. It's, it's just who I am. It's what I do. It's who, it's who I am. There is no real freedom without taking risks. Safety and freedom are on opposite ends of the continuum. And you're either moving more towards safety or, and, and, and slavery, or you're moving more toward taking risks and freedom. God made you to be a risk taker. God made you to live by faith. Don't die in the desert. Now let me contrast that with what the Bible says happens when we start to live our lives seeing everything by faith, learning to be a dreamer, learning to see God's vision, learning to look at things not as they are, but as they could be. How do you do that? And what, does, what difference does it make in my life? Well, let me explain these to you. Write these down. What happens when we see with eyes of faith? Six things, I could give you two dozen, but let me just give you six. Number one, faith shrinks my problems. The first thing that I do, when I begin to open the eyes of my heart, Lord, and I begin to see what God is doing around me, and I begin to look at things from God's viewpoint, it shrinks my problem, it gives you a new perspective. See, when you see your problem from God's point of view, well then, everything gets a whole lot more manageable. If you have a big God, problems get small. If you got a small God, problems get big. Now, when you come to the Lord and you say, Lord, you're a big God and you can handle this problem and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it to you and I'm, I'm gonna just let you work it out. I'm trusting you, I'm seeing with the eyes of it. Let you work it out, uh, then you can relax. And you say, well, how's it gonna be solved? You say, well, that's God's problem. <laughs> it's not my problem, it's, it's God's problem. Faith shrinks my problem. Genesis 18, 14 says, is anything too hard for the Lord? And the answer is obviously no. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. Luke 1, 37, Jesus says, for nothing is impossible with God. You know, if you were to come to my office and you were to go into my library and pull out my dictionary and look up the word impossible, you would find that the word impossible is not in my dictionary because 35 years ago, I cut it out. I said, if it's not in God's vocabulary, it's not in mine. The Bible says nothing is impossible with God. Faith shrinks my problems. Number two, faith opens the door for a miracle. Faith opens the door for a miracle. Faith can move mountains. You know, if you study the Bible and if you study history, you find that every time God moves out on, on earth and does a miracle, it's because somebody believed. Faith opens the door to miracles. Mark 11, Jesus said this, have faith in God. If you have faith in God and you don't doubt, you could tell this mountain to get up and jump into the sea. And it would. Whatever you ask for in prayer will be yours if you only have the faith. Now what's he talking about here? Telling a mountain to jump in the sea. God has set up the universe in, in a hierarchy of laws, and the law of faith is actually a higher law than the law or the laws of nature. And that's where miracles come in. Because when faith is used, the law of faith goes into practice, and God set up the fact that the law of faith can actually do more than the laws of physics. You know, if you actually had the real faith, you'd say, go jump into an ocean and, and the mountain would. And does God still perform miracles today? Of course he does. And during this, one of the reasons I'm excited about this campaign is that during this series, the Daring Faith series, Key to Miracles, we're gonna see some miracles. Every time you stretch your faith, God does miracles. Every single time. So my question is, we're getting ready to start this series. What's the mountain in your life? What's the mountain that needs to be moved? 
What's the thing you look at that thing, that thing, it's never moved, it hasn't moved, it's not gonna move, it never will move. What is the mountain in your life that you are saying, it's never gonna change? Well, you've already decided it. You, you, that's a self-defeating and self-fulfilling prophecy. How do you know? Maybe God wants to do a law of faith superseding the law of nature. He has. He has in the past, he has in the present. He's done it all around the world. It, faith opens the door for miracles. God is in the mountain moving business, but you must not doubt. Look at this verse on the screen. Matthew 13, 58 says, Jesus did not do many miracles. He's talking about that town there because of their lack of faith. Their lack of faith caused Jesus to not do many miracles. You say, I don't see any miracles in my life. Hmm, I wonder why. Are you seeing with the eyes of fear? Or are you seeing with the eyes of faith? Faith shrinks my problems. It opens the door to miracles. And number three, faith moves God to act on my behalf. Faith moves God to act on my behalf. Now don't get me wrong. When I say this, God, it moves God to act on my behalf. I do not believe, I do not subscribe to the health and wealth theology where God really ends up being a servant and that God serves you rather than you serving God. And in many versions of this, God becomes a genie where you rub the, you know, the bottle and you pray the prayer or you drop, drop the you know, 50 cent piece into the... Um, in, in the slot machine, whatever, and then you hit the jackpot. No, God is not your genie. God is God, and you're not, and he is not there to cater to your every whim. He's not, he's just not. But, at the same time, Matthew 9, 29, Jesus said this, according to your faith, it will be done to you. God says, you get to choose how much I bless your life. According to your faith, it will be done to you. Do you want to know why God has blessed my life? Not because I deserve it, because I don't. Not because I'm smarter than everybody else, because I'm not. Maybe because I'm better looking, but no, just kidding. Not, not because of any human thing at all. God has worked in my life because I humbly expect him to. I expect him to use me. And God does exactly what you expect him to do. According to your faith, it will be done unto you. If you expect God to do a little in your life, he'll do a little. If you expect God to do a lot, he'll do a lot. If you don't expect God to do anything, he won't do anything. This is why I'm gonna push you on your faith in this series. This is why I'm gonna stretch you and challenge you. Because I don't want you to be satisfied with playing in Kitty Beach in the shallows of life. I want you to put, put on your big boy swimsuit and dive in the deep end. And I want you to challenge yourself to believe God more than you've ever believed him for. I have believed God for some really big things in my life. But I didn't start there. It started by developing the muscle of faith a little at a time. And when I saw God did that, well then God could do that. And I just keep pressing and pushing and stretching and the Bible says, according to your faith, it will be done to you. Any of you as a parent knows that as a mom or a dad, fa fathers love to bring pleasure to their kids and even more to their grandkids. And when they do that, it brings them pleasure. It gives God pleasure providing for you. It gives God pleasure watching you succeed. And he goes, that's my girl. She's being exactly who I made her to be. That's my boy. He's being exactly who I made him to be. And the Bible says, God takes pleasure in the success of his saints. And so according to your faith, it will be done unto you. See, the problem with us is we think the wrong thing moves God. God is not moved by my complaints. God is never moved by my griping, my complaining, my grumbling, my whining, none of that moves God. But God is moved when I say, God, I'm trusting you and I'm expecting you to keep your promise. You put your name on that promise and I'm expecting you to do it. 
That brings me to the fourth benefit of faith. Faith unlocks all the promises of God. Faith unlocks all the promises of God. You know, we've talked about this many times here at Saddleback Church. That there are over 7,000 promises in this book, in the Bible, from cover to cover, over 7,000 promises. And they're like blank checks waiting for you to, to claim them. And if you want to be a person of faith, a man of faith or a woman of faith, you must learn to become a promise person. Memorize the promises of God so that you can claim them in your life when you need them. And what does God have to say about all 7,000 of those promises? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are all yes in Christ. Circle that, yes in Christ. All of the promises that God has made in his Bible, in his word, in the scripture, are yes in Christ. And faith unlocks the promises of God. Now let, let, let me just try to put it this way. What if you were to find, um, you were going through an old attic that you'd bought a house and people had died and nobody claimed the, the leftovers. You're going through the attic and you, you find a letter promising a million dollars to anybody who finds the letter. Would you be interested? Yes, yes, you would be interested. But would it be useful if you didn't know who wrote it? No. It'd be worthless. You could be holding on to a promise that says, I will give whoever has this, uh, this letter $1 million. No, you'd have to, you could only use it, claim the promises, if you knew the name and the address of the person making the promise. The promises of the Bible only apply to those who know the author, to those who know the name of Jesus. All the promises are yes in Christ. And when you know him personally, now you know the guarantor of all the promises of scripture. And faith unlocks them. Number five, faith turns dreams, God-given dreams, into reality. Faith turns God-given dreams into reality. Now this is so important, we're gonna spend an entire session on it during this uh, campaign on daring to dream because nothing happens till somebody starts dreaming and I wanna challenge you to dream about your relationships, to dream about your, your marriage, a family, uh, your, your career. We're gonna dream together about the future of this church. We're gonna go through a dreaming period time. The Bible is full of people who had God-given dreams. Abraham dreamed of being the father of a great nation. Moses dreamed of setting the people free. Joseph dreamed of saving the nation and his own family. Um, Daniel and Paul and David, and, and, and over and over and over, all through scripture, all kinds of people who were inspiring dreamers. But they didn't even have a verse that we have today, and it's this verse, Ephesians 3.20. Glory be to God, who by his mighty power, his mighty power at work within us, is able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers and desires and thoughts or hopes. Now, if there ever there was a blank check verse in the Bible, that's it. He says, God is able to do far more than we would dare to ask. What are you afraid to ask God for? God is able to do far more than we can even dream of. I don't know about you, but I'm a pretty big dreamer. I can think of some pretty big dreams. I have in my lifetime. And God says, Warren, you think of the greatest thing you could ever dream of, the greatest thing you think I could do in your life, and guess what, I can top that. We limit God by our unbelief. I think one of the, the biggest, if there, were, if there were tears in heaven, it would simply because we would get there and we realize all the things that could have done if we would just believe God for a little bit more. To me, that would be hell. Hell would be to be shown everything I could have accomplished and done and become and been as a husband, as a father, as a man, as a pastor. All that I could have 
been and all that I could have done good in the world if I had just believed God a little bit more. I want to push you to believe God a little bit more than you ever have before. Because God's able to do far more than we would dare to ask or even dream of. Number six, let me just end with this one. Faith gives me power to hold on in tough times. This is why we are doing Daring Faith for 10 weeks. Because it unlocks the promises of God. And, and it shows us the power of God. And it, it, it gives us, turns dreams into reality. And it gives me the power to hold on in tough times. Why is this one important? Because faith doesn't always take you out of the problem. You know that. Faith often takes you through the problem. Faith doesn't always take away the pain. Faith gives you the ability to handle the pain. Faith doesn't make life heaven on earth. This world is never going to be heaven on earth. Things are never going to go perfectly on this planet. You will always have pain and you will always have suffering in your life. But faith gives you the ability to handle it. It doesn't take you out of the storm. It calms you in the storm. I remember reading the stories of Corrie ten Boom who was in a young woman sent to the Nazi death camps, the prison concentration death camps of Buchenwald and Auschwitz. And, and she said that the, the people who lasted in those camps were those who had the deepest faith. Why? Because faith gives me the power to hold on in tough times. It, it produces persistence. It gives you the ability to bounce back. Study after study after study after study has shown that probably the most important characteristic you could teach a child and probably the most important characteristic you need in your own life if you're going to make it in life is actually resilience. Resilience. It's the ability to bounce back. It's the ability to keep going. Why? Because nobody goes through life with an unbroken chain of, of successes. Everybody has failures, flops, duds, mistakes. We all embarrass ourselves. Nobody goes through life scot-free. We all have pains. We all have problems. We all have pressures. The people who make it in life have resiliency. I've told this to pastors many times. You don't want to know how many times I've wanted to re resign as pastor of Saddleback Church? Just every Monday morning. They go, God, it's too big. It's, it's too many people, too much responsibility. I'm not smart enough. I, I, what am I supposed to say to that many people? Get somebody else who can do a better job than this. And yet God says, keep on keeping on. And where do you get that keeping on keeping on? There's so many times over 35 years I wanted to just give up. There are a lot of things I could have done you know, uh, easier. And after Purpose Driven Life came out, I effectively retired. I don't take a salary. So nobody pays me to stay here. What, what is it that keeps me going? Faith. I want to see what God's going to do next. I don't want to miss out on it. That's why I don't like to miss really any week at church because I want to think, is that going to be the week that could change my life? I just never know if that's going to be the message that might just set the new direction for the next five or ten years. I just want to be there and be there and listen. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 9, Paul's testimony, we're pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed and we're not broken. He said we're perplexed. That means we're confused. We don't know why, why this happened. We're perplexed, but we don't give up and quit. We're attacked, but God never abandons us. And we get knocked down, but we're not knocked out. He says we get up and we, we keep going. Where do you get resilience like that? Faith. Now do you see why you need to work on strengthening your faith probably more than anything else and why we're going to spend 10 weeks on it? Because it is faith that does these six things. Shrinks my problems, opens the door for miracles, moves God to act on my behalf, unlocks all the promises of God, turns dreams into reality, and gives me the power to hold on in tough times. And by the way, faith is the way we get to know God. 
John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, that means has faith in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. It's how we get to know God. So what are we gonna do? In the next 10 weeks, there on your outline, here, here's what I want you to do in Daring Faith Campaign. First, I want you to watch and discuss the six video studies that are in a small group. And I've taken some of my best materials and I've taught it on, on those lessons. And I want you to, to get in a small group if you're not in one. And here's how you do that. Just start one. If you, your first step of faith, if you're not in a small group, is this. Start one. Go out and get one friend and say, would you like to study faith with me for six weeks? Watch these videos. I need somebody to talk it over with. You get one person. And then the two of you find another person. Now you got three. Jesus said where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. You don't have to have 10 people out of a small group. You don't have to have eight. You have three, four. Just if you will make the commitment, that's your first step of faith. The first step of faith is to make a commitment to get in a small group by starting one if you're not in one. And then the second thing is to read the daily inspirations in your workbook as a daily devotional. Then number three, listen to all 10 messages that are gonna be on the weekend of the campaigns. Then carry the weekly Bible verse with you. And then I'm gonna ask you, and we're gonna talk about these in, in days ahead, to set three faith goals for growing, giving, and going. Growing, giving, and going. You're gonna hear those phrases. If you're gonna be a woman of faith or a man of faith, you've gotta grow in faith in your growing, in your giving, and in your going. And we'll talk about what that means in each, each of those. Now, as I said earlier, you can't claim the promises of God unless you know the man who made the promises, and his name is Jesus Christ. And there might be somebody listening this weekend who has not stepped across the line and given their lives to Christ. If you don't do that, you're not gonna get any of this. It's gonna be a total waste the next 10 weeks. It starts with a relationship. You know, I remember when I was a little boy and America started the space race and we were racing the communists or the, the, the Russians to see who was gonna get to the moon first. And, the, and for a while, Russia was actually ahead. And they were sending up cosmonauts before we were traveling, all, before our astronauts went out into space. And I remember uh, Yuri Gagarin, who was a very famous Russian cosmonaut, atheist, and he was the first man to go up and circle the earth. And when he came down, he said this. He said, I was an eagle. He said, I searched the heavens and I found no God. I didn't look, I looked for God in the heavens when I was up there and I did not see him. There is no God. And all the atheists applauded and said, yeah, Yuri, you just proved there is no God. A, a, a few months later, John Glenn, who by the way was a Christian and later served as a, as a senator but was an astronaut in the Gemini program, went up and circled the earth three times. When John Glenn came down, his first words in his interview were, I saw God everywhere. I said I felt his glory in the heavens, I saw his presence in the stars, I felt his power in the sun, I saw God everywhere. Which one was telling the truth? The answer is, they both were. They both were. Because Jesus said in John chapter three, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't see what God is doing behind the scenes. You can't see the miracles. You can't see the mighty things he's doing. You just can't see it because you're not tuned in. You can't see the promises. So you need to give your life to Christ today as we start this series. Let's bow our heads. And I've got two prayers that I want you to pray. First, if you already know Jesus Christ, and he's a part of your life and you're serving him as best you know how. I want you to just say this simple prayer. Dear Jesus, help me to see with eyes of faith, not fear. Help me to see with eyes of faith, not fear. You might even say, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. And say, Lord, use this series 
to challenge and to stretch my faith so that I might be more the person that you want me to be. I want to bring pleasure to your life. And if you've never opened your life to Jesus Christ, then your simple step is to say, Jesus, yes. Yes, as much as I know how, I open my life, my heart to you. Just say that, Jesus Christ, as much as I know how, I open my life to you. I want to learn to love you and trust you and follow you. I want to put my faith in you. Strengthen my faith. In your name I pray, amen.